I wasn't quite sure when I came in. I saw that thing and I thought I got in McDonald's. I... <laughs> but then this place is always full of surprises. Um, I didn't really expect to do this uh, little thing this morning. I, I'm not going to preach really and um, uh, I don't think I'm going to teach, actually. I, I'm going to share some thoughts that I shared the other day uh, with Brother Tony. Tony isn't here? No. Ed isn't here? Oh, Ed is there. Tim isn't here? Oh, there he is. I thought they were afraid of getting under conviction and they hadn't come, but... Uh, <laughs> but anyhow, it's good to see that they're here because... You, you never know what will happen. Let's look at Paul's second letter to Timothy and the uh, second chapter, 2 Timothy 2. That's easy to say, 2 Timothy 2 and twice 2 is 4, so it's 2 Timothy 2, 4. Let, let me ask you this thing. Um, I think one of the nicest and, and most, I was going to say sensible hymns, but one that has real validity and, and uh, abiding worth, you know, some songs come and go. This is an old one. My grandmother used to sing it. And uh, there's an awful lot of truth in it. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. And if we get in darkness, very often it's because we've got out of the light of the word. So let's sing that. When we walk with the Lord. With the Lord. Think quicker. In the light of his word. What a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still. And with all who will trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy. You know what the alternative to that is? If we don't trust and obey, we rust and decay. <coughs> so you better think about that too. All right, Paul's second letter to Timothy, chapter 2, verse 4, or verse 3. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him, to be a soldier. <clears throat> this is, in my judgment, the advice of a five-star general, battle-scarred and worn, to a, a kind of a rookie preacher. Here is a man who is finishing his ministry. It's very interesting that he uses, uh, he uses three analogies in the reading here. And your hardness as a good soldier, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if any man also strive for mastery, he changes there from a soldier to a runner. And then he changes again, he says in verse 6, the husbandmen that labour must be first partakers of the fruit. <clears throat> in the many changes that we have in the Church of Jesus Christ today. I think there's nothing more pronounced than the, the uh, change in singing. I was raised on a very strict diet. I had a very godly father and a very wonderful saintly praying mother and a, a dear old grandmother that was a praying woman too. <clears throat> but in the house the conversation was always about missions and saving people. And my father's hero was none other than C.T. Studd. As a matter of fact, I saw C.D. Stud once when I was a youngster, a youngster. As a matter of fact, I'm told I once saw William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, but that was in the past century. But <clears throat> when I was a kid, it was always the militant side of the gospel that was presented in the house. And you went to church and they would sing something like, Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Or, soldiers of Christ, arise and put your armor on. 
or stand up, stand up for Jesus, he sold it at the cross. The, the, the militant side was always there. Now we go to church, it's a mansion over the hilltop, or something about jelly babies and something, it's, uh, it, 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 it's not militant. It's not the sense of that we're in a warfare. And I sometimes think, I, I wonder if we're not dishonest when we say to people, well, you're saved now, you know, and praise the Lord, your sins are all forgiven, and boy, you've got it all made. You've got a mansion over the hilltop, you've got a mansion on Main Street, as a matter of fact, and uh, <clears throat> in heaven, the streets are paved with gold. You know who the evangelists are, they'll be digging the streets up, but apart from that, uh, <clears throat> you're going to have a mansion on Main Street, and um, you're, well, you're going to have a a permit to the marriage supper of the Lamb, and you're going to wear a five-decker crown, and you're going to rule over five cities, and uh, boy, you've got it all made. Just for about five minutes of repentance, you're going to have an eternity with all these things thrown in, and, you know, five-decker crown, we'll all be saying, boy, I, I thought you'd only have three crowns, and you've got five. <clears throat> there are five crowns in the New Testament, but they're sure not for everybody. But again, this militant side is, is no longer presented. Now, what we should say to people, you've not only got rid of your sins, if you really got what God wanted you get, to get here, you've got rid of yourself. And right here, you've no rights anymore. You've lost all your rights. For as soon as a soldier signs on the dotted line, he's lost all his rights. They used to say about men in England, they signed up for the king's shilling, because if they were broke, they'd go into a recruiting place and say, I want to be a soldier. And they'd sign up, and the man would give them a sum of money. Well, that was all right unless war broke out. And then war breaks out and uh, you, you get your draft papers and they're trying to reinstitute it again here. In fact, I'm wondering if this oil crunch isn't uh, the fact the government's saving oil for war and there's a lot of other things that suggest there's something bad coming up. But uh, as soon as the man is drafted, he, you know, he can't say, well, uh, uh, Uncle Sam, you've just forgotten. I've only been married a week. And... Uh, my wife can't stay in the home by herself, and not only that, I've just gone into business. Immediately he signs on the body line to become a soldier. He has no priority even with his wife. He has to say, well, darling, I don't know when I'll, uh, where I'm going, or when I'll come back, or if I'll come back, or if I'll be a triple amputee, or if I'll come minus an eye or a leg or some other, I, I just don't know. Now, we don't present a heroic gospel. We present a gospel of uh, almost self-pity and get out of your rotten sins and escape a jail sentence and get out of drugs. All very wonderful, but that's still a negative side of the thing. Now, Paul here is writing to this young man. He says, therefore, endure hardness as a good soldier. Across the page, in my Bible, maybe it's in the previous page with yours, at the end of the previous epistle to Timothy, he says in the last chapter, which is what, the fifth or uh, the sixth chapter of the previous letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy uh, 6 verse 12, fight the good fight of faith and lay hold of eternal life. Now if you go ahead uh, further into the, uh, the second epistle and get into the third chapter of the second epistle, Pardon me, it's the fourth chapter. He finishes by saying, well, what, well, let me ask you this. What are the last words of the Apostle Paul? Right, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. He's still in a militant attitude, even though he's battled scarred and bruised and baffled and bleeding, but he says, even at the end of the line, now he's saying to this young man, Timothy, you're a good soldier, be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. It's my guess, and I think I've, I've scriptural confirmation to it, that when he wrote this epistle, he was already chained to a soldier. Notice at the end of this life of his, he says, I have fought a good fight. I like his modesty. If we'd done all he'd done, heavens, he'd, he'd written more than... Well, well let's, let me uh, transfer it again to a little later when he says, I glory in tribulations in necessities. Glory in them, we run away from them. Who's going to go down the road if there's a lion in the way? Well, Samson went. And if Samson is a type of a spiritual believer, which I believe he is, 
The lion must be a type of the devil that goes about seeking whom he may devour. And yet he isn't intimidated by it. He says to his dad and mum, you stay here, I've a little business to do around the corner, and he goes and catches the lion and rips it in two and throws it down. Now that's wonderful. <laughs> the only thing more wonderful is the second half of that verse in which he says he said nothing about it. Well, bless you, we'd have photographed it at least, wouldn't we? <laughs> we'd have put it on the front of our church magazine and we said, listen, Agape didn't do this. I did it all by myself. I wanted to know that, man. I've got to get my credit, you know. It deals with my ego, it deals with my faith. Can see, and then in heaven. Uh, but, but this is actually, see, what Jesus Christ left us in our inheritance. Now, let me ask you a simple question. You push the devil around, does he push you around? A lady in Australia said to me one day, she said, you know, Mr. Raymond, I've had an awful day. And I said, you look like it. She looked as though she'd been to ten funerals and lost everything she had all in one day. She looked the essence of misery. She said, yes, but you know, when I got out of bed this morning, the devil was standing on the rug at the side of my bed. I looked at her and I said, lady, I seriously doubt that he knows you're living. What in the world have you done that Satan came to your bedroom? You know what we do? We give Satan the attributes of God. Satan can't be in two places at the same time. He can only be one. And if he's been with you all day, shout hallelujah, for he's left the rest of the world alone. I think the greatest honor that was ever given to any man on earth was given to the Apostle Paul when, uh, you remember some fellows decided to kick the devil or knock the devil out of somebody and the demons jumped out and beat those sons of Sceva up and said, Jesus we know and Paul we know. Now, do you really believe in your heart you're on the devil's danger list? In all the world of preachers that I know, I don't think I know five men who are on Satan's danger list. I know men who are oozing with knowledge and wisdom and, and ability and personality and all the other stuff that goes over big these days. But the greatest thing I would uh, uh, hope for right now is not to be considered a great preacher or a, a good writer or anything else. I remember walking in Westminster Abbey and somebody said, do you think your name will ever be on the wall there at the side of John Wesley? I'm not even interested, never thought of it. <coughs> Wouldn't interest me a bit. I'll tell you what, I would like my name. I'd like my name in letters about as tall as that wall, say uh, 18 feet, 15 feet high. Great big neon sign, Leonard Ray. Where? In Hollywood, Volno, in hell. I'd like every demon to have to get up every morning and say, is he still living? <laughs> I kind of figure the day that, 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 that the Apostle Paul died, the devil said, you demons, you can all have a day off. There's nobody else like him going to be around for years and years and years. Remember, this man has no criminal record. He's one of the most holy men in the world at the time he was saved from the standpoint of being not only a Pharisee, but a Pharisee of the Pharisee. His father was a Pharisee, he was a Pharisee, he's of the tribe of Benjamin, he's of the seed of Abraham, he has everything that everybody else is reaching for, and then he did what we think and don't do. My richest gain I count but lost. What things were, 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 were things that I'd striven for, and I love them, he says, what things were gain to me, I counted them but dross. One interpretation makes it rather offensive, it says, I counted them but done that I might win Christ and be found in heaven. Not in any righteousness of my own. Now Paul again, I say, is writing here to a young man who is just starting on a course that Paul is finishing and he looks back over that zigzag course and he doesn't say, you know what, I, I want to tell you this. If you're faithful, you know what, you may write more books than I've written. You may, get, may go to prison more often. Uh, I was lashed once with 40 stripes, saved one five times, that's uh, uh, five forties is 200 minus. Uh, I, I, I was lashed 195 times, I've been in tribulation, distress, famine, peril, nakedness, sword, 
in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the deep, and he goes it on and he says, you know what, I hope you'll break my spiritual record. I, I, I just say to myself, you know, after all, since Jesus, there's nobody in the world been like me. He doesn't say that at all. What does he say? He says, I glory in necessities, in reproaches, in adversity, in calamity, and in tragedy. Well, that's quite a bit, isn't it? It doesn't sound like strawberries and cream. <clears throat> it doesn't sound as though he lived in Easy Street. He loved this young man. In the first epistle, he calls him the, uh, 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 Timothy, my, uh, what do you call him, my beloved son in the gospel, somewhere here. All right, 1 Timothy 1, uh, 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 1 Timothy, first chapter, verse 2. Unto Timothy, my own beloved son, he, he esteems him as a son. He wants to see all these amazing qualities of his own life reproduced in the life of his, his, his spiritual offspring. And he says, I want to tell you this, you're going to have to fight the good fight of faith. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I kept the faith. So he interprets the Christian life in three ways. It's a fight. It's a race in which you run. It's a stewardship. You have to give an account. You know, we say it about somebody, you might say about the young lady who played the piano. She's a lovely talent. That's not a talent. We say about somebody who sings or somebody that does something else. Well, he or she has a wonderful talent. But if you go down to the scripture, you'll discover in the scripture that talents always have a, uh, a monetary value. There's a talent of silver and a talent of gold. It is not a talent. It may be a gift. It is not necessarily a talent. Now, Paul wasn't an over-talented man. I think, I think he's the greatest genius that ever lived. You can put Socrates and Plato and all the other Greeks in there. I think he was the wisest man that ever lived after Jesus himself. And he's trying to instill into this young man here that you've got three things to do. You have to fight a fight, you have to run a race, and uh, you have to um, give an account for your stewardship. Now he kicks off right here in saying, Thou therefore endure hardness. I can't deal with this thing altogether. Let me just give you some tips here on what it means that to be a soldier. First, there's a total surrender. The man has to surrender all his rights. He surrenders his freedom once he becomes a soldier. He, he's manipulated by the government. They say, well, we're going to send you to so-and-so. And he says, it's not very healthy. No, it's not very healthy. Reminds me of an oil company sent their executives out to the Middle East, or representatives. <clears throat> Not one of them lasted more than a year. They, they all came back. Finally, they got a toughie who had been to Oxford or Cambridge or somewhere, and he was athletic and strong and smart. And he had everything needed to do the job. And uh, after he'd been there about uh, six months, he wrote for headquarters, and oh boy, he had a string of things to say. He said, the climate here is unbearable. The people are inhospitable. The food is uh, it, it's not eatable. The water is undrinkable. The hedonism is unbearable. And he went down and down the list like that, and finally they turned the letter over on the other side. He said, I'm not complaining, I'm explaining. A lot of us do a lot of complaining, I think. Let's settle for this right now. Immediately I sign on the line, I have that God has every right to show me that I'm expendable. I read something the other day that I thought was interesting. It said, if you, if you begin to think you're important even in the kingdom of God, here's a good test for you. Fill a bucket with water and... Uh, Push your hand down to the bottom and then lift it out and the hole you leave is the impression you've made on life or on the world. It's not too thrilling, is it? <clears throat> but anyhow, you know, ten minutes after you're dead, apart from one or two relatives who may weep for joy or sorrow or whatever it is, uh, you'll be forgotten. I don't think any of you sat down this morning and said, well, praise God for John Wesley and Charles Finney and... I was just ringing, singing one of those great hymns of uh, Charles Wesley. He wrote about 3,000 of them. So we, we, we soon pass away. <clears throat> we pass out of memory. 
It's great to recognize this, that I'm not here to make a name or fame or anything else for myself. I'm here to do what this blessed man of God did, to say at the end of the journey, not I'm a good fighter. Most men would have said, I'm a good fighter. You don't know how many people I've, I've destroyed. That is, destroyed their theories and destroyed their, their horrible hedonism. He doesn't glory in all the things he's done. He doesn't say, listen, I've written 14 epistles. He had, if you give him Hebrews, and I think he wrote it. He doesn't say, I've traveled more than anybody else. He doesn't say, I've stood before more kings than anybody else. He doesn't say, I've been to more countries than anybody else. He doesn't say, I'm the most remarkable man there are. He, he never lists any of those things at all. He says, I glory in tribulation and in necessities and in reproaches. Now I say the first thing, let's say, involved in being a soldier is their surrender. And with surrender somewhere, both in the immediate context of the word there, when we start off and right down the road, surrender means there's going to be sacrifice. Now, now let's, let, if, if we can't do it. If you could put all the achievements of the Apostle Paul there. Think when kings used to tremble in front of him. That, that's a joke as far as I'm concerned. I don't mean it's... It's silly in that sense. I get a great lift out of it. At the top of my Bible it says, for instance, in Acts 26, Paul before Agrippa. That's pure nonsense. It was Agrippa before Paul. Paul hardly got going when he says, hey, hold it, you're, you're going to persuade me to be a Christian. He stands up before King Felix and Felix's knees began to knock together and he says, oh, 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 hold it, hold it. Felix trembled. Well, well, why did he come to this fantastic conclusion? Why, why did God get out of this life so much? Famous last words. The most famous of all the words of Jesus. When he said it is finished. The second most famous, I think, of these of the Apostle Paul. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I kept the faith. Now, those are the famous last words. What was the first word that Paul said? Because you can't have the last without the first. What's the secret of his life? But, good, what wilt thou have me to do? That was his constant theme right through his life. You can't have that without this. That's why he said, I die daily. There was a time when he died, he went to the cross himself. If you come further down in this chapter, in the, uh, which we were looking at there, the second chapter of 2 Timothy, it says there in uh, verse 11, it is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also, well, if we're dead with him, we shall also live with him. Well, you remember in Romans 6, 8, he says we are crucified with Christ. Y you can't do much with a dead man. I mean, he may, he may have been a miser while he lived, and you go shake some shekels of gold at the side of him when he's dead, he's not gonna, he's not gonna grasp them. He, he could have been the greatest virtuoso the world has ever known, playing the violin, and you go and play something on the violin, you don't move it, the man is dead. In other words, he does not respond to anything that previously he has magnetized him and fascinated him, fascinated him and mesmerized him. And Paul turns his back. He, he's already got a record in one sense. He says, uh, uh, there in Acts 26 again, he says, well, with all my religion and piety, and I, I passed off as the number one uh, hero in my community, and yet he says, when I think of it, I, I, I hailed men and women to prison. I, I, I chased them to strange city. He, he had destroyed homes and that other thing. And now God has worked that fantastic miracle of grace in him. I think there's nothing more wonderful to me, than reading the 26th of Acts where he testifies that on that Damascus road, he says, I was breathing out threatening. You can almost see the fire coming out of his nostrils. He hates this cult that's written up, this Christianity, that dares to stand against a background of Judaism with all the prophets and the law and the mighty works of God and a bunch of scattered, tattered people come and say that they have a new revelation and they have a power to turn the world upside down. I was reading, I am still reading a book which is a bit of a toughie, but I suggest you read it. I read it slowly, digest it. It is called The Sky is Red. It's by Jeffrey Bull, and it's um, printed by Moody. You know, a man with an experience is never at the mercy of a man with an argument. 
A man with an experience is never at the mercy of a man with an argument. And the reason I can listen to Geoffrey Bull or the Apostle Paul is Geoffrey Bull went to China to learn Chinese and he learned it. And then he, he slipped into Tibet. And then the communists came later and he was put in a communist prison and they just did about everything except break his faith. They almost broke his mind and he was in a terrible state of affliction. And out of it he has, uh, well he wrote what, uh, when I engage yield and uh, I think God has the key. And, and this is something a little more advanced than his first book obviously. But you know he says this in the book that, uh, and this really got hold of me, I'm going to work on it. But he says there are some people content to watch the grave clothes. Remember the angels were still watching the grave clothes. And he says we have a lot of people content to guard the grave clothes. But the world even today is asking the question, where is he who says, I have seen the Lord? And you know, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, he gives you a list of all those people. Jesus was seen of uh, Peter, and he was seen of Mary, and he was seen of these, and he, and he was seen of 500 brethren, and he says, that's all right. But I want to tell you something that changed the whole world as far as I'm concerned. He was seen of me also. And that makes all the difference. Going down that Damascus road, he said, the light shone on me, and he was blinded. Well, I'm going to play on that and tell you that I suggest to you that seriously this morning, I don't think he was anything else but blinded to the rest of his life. He never saw anything. All he saw was the cross. All he saw was the finished work of Jesus Christ. He could go to any hell hole you like. You could send him down into Corinth. After all, who has a life like the Apostle Paul? He began his life in the ancient capital of the world, which was Tarsus. He finished his life in the military capital of the world, which was Rome. In between, he went to the religious capital of the world, Jerusalem. He went to the intellectual capital of the world in Acts 16, in, uh, uh, when, when he went to, to Athens. He went to the immoral capital of the world, which was Corinth. <clears throat> and it was there, you remember, where he said, I'm not going to philosophize anymore. Oh, he got a colossal intellect. I'd like to have sat down with a the Stoics and poets and philosophers and teachers and they saw this little uh, semi-hunchback man come up and sit there and, and they were startled they said wow the, the, this man seems to know everything he counted their philosophy with philosophy poetry with poetry history with history for, uh, religion with religion God this guy's oozing with wisdom and then he led them up the garden path and then finally as I think Dr. Je uh, Stuart of Scotland said, he sounded the trumpet that only the Christian can sound. You know what it was? It was the trumpet of the resurrection. <laughs> he said, your Moses and all your other people, they're still in the dirt. But you know what? The Jesus I preached, he went down in the grave. And you know what this morning? He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. He didn't say he's alive in him. He says he's alive in me, not in heaven. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. The most insane thing that men ever did was try to put eternal life to death. After all, Jesus was eternal life, and they thought you could nail eternal life to a cross. Unwise men, idiots. <clears throat> He's a sum and substance of all our needs. <clears throat> Buddha died saying he was searching for life. Jesus said that he was life at the beginning of his ministry. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way, without him there's no going. I am the truth, without him there's no knowing. I am the life, without him there's no growing. I am the way, that's external. I am the truth, that's internal. I am the life, that's eternal. In other words, he would have embraced with joy the words of Charles Wesley when he said in that lovely hymn, Jesus, lover of my soul, Thou, O Christ, art all I want. Now, if Christ isn't everything to you, before you get out, before long, you'll be smitten with self-pity and sorrow and hardship, and, and you'll be complaining that somebody's riding a better bus than you, that our bus always breaks down, and they got a new one, and we didn't, and we've been in a gap longer than someone else, and, and boy, you'll soon have a lot of problems. But if Jesus Christ is the center and the circumference of everything, it doesn't make that much difference anyhow. Sure, there's surrender. Sure, there's going to be sacrifice. Not only sacrifice, there's going to be strategy because we are against an adversary. 
And yet the Word of God says we're not ignorant of his devices. Personally, I don't believe the devil can engineer any new thing against you. He's had 6,000 years of practice with human personality. He's pretty skilled at it. Don't you get conceited and say, you know, I'm going through things nobody ever went through. Well, make yourself a medal. <clears throat> I mean, if you're so heroic, make it. Make it as big as a frying pan so everybody will see it, you know. You're not going through anything that somebody hasn't gone through before. Supposing this morning, you were in the Gulag Archipelago. I don't believe that this baloney, God wants you to be filled with the Spirit and be rich. That's, that's, there's nothing appeals to people more than selfishness. God will make you rich. God will make it easy. Praise the Lord. I listened to that testimony this morning. That was great. But what when God doesn't deliver? Hebrews 11 is wonderful. The first chapter. Tell me, the first part of it baffles me, humiliates me. Why? Because it says those people in the Old Testament subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. They even raised the dead. You know, I read that for about 50 years, maybe 60, and then one day, just like that, as I read it, I said, oh my. Subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. And yet not one of them ever had a Bible. How much they did without it? How little you and I do with it? It's awesome when you think that God has not spoken to this world for 2,000 years. Oh, he speaks down again through a prophet. We go to a meeting and somebody has a word of prophecy. We all come excited and you've forgotten what it is before you leave the place. It was a momentary blessing. But the men of the caliber that we have here in the New Testament are extremely rare. You do get a C.D. Stone here. You do get a Hudson Taylor. You do get a, a, a Jeffrey Bull. But you see, God never designed that any of us should be weak in the sense that we see the manifestation of weakness in this day in which we live. There has to be strategy and there has to be suffering. Now we're in a warfare. <clears throat> And sometimes we stack up all the things that are against us. Do you know what's against us? The world and the flesh and the devil. You're dead right. That's true. That part of the uh, hostility against us. The world, the flesh, the devil. But there's a scripture that says that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. <clears throat> against us is the world, the flesh and the devil. What is there for us? But let me tell you what's for us. The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, all these exceeding great and precious promises, 2,000 years of Christian history. When Satan fell, he took a third part of the heavenly host, so two-thirds of them are still left on our side. Now what more do you want? We've got against us the world, the flesh, and the devil. We've got for us the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, two-thirds of the heavenly host, all the promises of God, the fellowship of the saints. It's all stacked up on our side. Not on the enemy's side. Now I say, I can listen to this man because, again, he, he has a, an amazing record. <clears throat> He's writing to this young man, he's saying, listen, if you look at me, there's <laughs> nothing very charming. I'm quite sure that one of Paul's eyes was slanted like this, and his jaw was a bit withered, and he limped along like this. He'd never have made it in our day, he didn't have the personality, you know. When I was a kid, nobody talked about personality, they talked about character. Now you've got, you can make a man of personality, all you've got to do is tease his hair, put him a charming suit on, and a nice tie or something else. You know, like you fellows, you see a girl at night coming down, oh, isn't she a dream? Later you find she is. But anyhow, uh, <clears throat> you see at 7 o'clock at night, she's so beautiful. You want to do slip round at 7 o'clock in the morning and see her. You say, they lied to me. They told me that she turned to, to a princess and she's still Cinderella. She never changed back. She's still got her rags on and doesn't look so good. But the accent today is on personality. It's a cult. 
I don't think there was one iota of attraction about the Apostle Paul. All the magnetism in it, and he wanted it that way, that he gloried in the cross of Jesus Christ. Sure he prayed. He had some marvelous answers to prayer. But he didn't always get through. You don't, don't, don't put a hair on his head. He didn't always get through. He says, lest I be exalted above measure. This is in, the, in uh, Galatians 12. Uh, pardon me, it's in uh, 2 Corinthians 12. Uh, he says, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations that were given unto me. Oh, he could have gloried in the revelations. Nobody had them like he had. I say the secret is this. If you see the Lord every morning in his risen splendor and power, and I'm sure that he did that, he not only saw him on the Damascus Road, do you remember on one occasion he was caught up into the third heaven? Boy, that would have made a book, wouldn't it? The Lord would never give a woman a revelation like that because the condition was he hadn't to say anything about it. <clears throat> but uh, you remember what the Lord said to him? I can't prove this, but I think that somewhere maybe that just like John had that revelation on the, on the Isle of Patmos, that one day God gave exactly the same revelation to, to, to Paul, but he wouldn't let him write it. This is just between you and I. There are some things God will never let you share. You say, I, I want to testify this week, God gave me a secret. Well, as soon as you secret, uh, say it, you insult God. If you gave me a secret, and I said, uh, I was talking with John there, he told me a secret. He likes that girl over there with the blue eyes and the dad's rich. <clears throat> but anyhow, uh, do you think he'd trust me again? Sometimes we remember God said a thing to us. We should have kept it secret. Like Mary, she pondered. Have you ever thought of Mary? And Joseph says, I don't, know, I don't understand Mary. To me, she looks pregnant, but boy, she never said a word to me. I, I, I'm a bit bad. It must have been pretty difficult. She kept her mouth shut. She didn't say a word about it. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. Paul had his secrets. Paul had revelation beyond anybody else. He had ministry beyond anybody else. And yet he says, in spite of all my revelation, in spite of all my heroism, as you think of it, in spite of all my achievements, he says, I prayed for a thorn in the flesh and it didn't go away. And I prayed again and it didn't go away. And I prayed again and it didn't go away. And you know why it didn't? Because God was going to get more glory with that thorn in his flesh than if he took it out. There are times when God will not answer your prayer. You can't, you, you can't twist God's arm, as we say. I, read a, I, I received a tape the other day from a lady teacher. A lot of it's very good, but she says, you know, uh, in John 15, it says that we're to abide in the Word, and there's only one reason prayers are not answered. We don't abide in the Word. We've got other motives in asking. And I thought, sister, that fits in the American economy, but if you were stinking in a hole like, uh, again, the Gulag Archipelago or in a prison in China this morning, would you dare put that over to the folk who've been there? What about those guys still uh, in, uh, in Korea from the Korean War? They've been there 25 years. There's someone, something like 600 American boys that never came back. I have a paper this week that says they know the names. They know where some of them are. The government won't do a thing. Are you going to suggest nobody's prayed with sincerity for them? The older I get, the more I, I, I realize that great is the mystery of godliness. God can't be explained. God can be experienced. But, but God says to Paul, My strength is my, pardon me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. <clears throat> now, Listen to this for a catalogue. He says, therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. Now can you and I, can, can you really say that you embrace them? You, you get hold of that particular trial, that hardship, that difficulty, that misrepresentation, that thing which has been hurting so long and say, Lord, I'm not just bearing and saying, oh, I'm glad there are not 25 hours in the day I would have died under the pressure. You say, Lord, I, I, I glory in tribulation. I rejoice in it. 
Why? What does the scripture say? Whom the Lord loveth, he, he makes them prosperous, and they have servants, and live in easy street, and don't know anything. It doesn't say that in the Amplified even. What, what, <clears throat> well, what is the scripture? Hmm? Whom the Lord loveth, he, and scourgeth every son that he receiveth, you see, the heart is cleansed by the blood. The mind is cleansed by the rod. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. The question is, what's your breaking point? Can you say to God, Lord, put a burden on me that nobody else wants to carry? I glory in it. Listen to this word. This is, this is from J.B. Phillips. It's a good translation. It's English. Uh, <clears throat> but it's uh, in Paul's letter, second letter to the Corinthians chapter 6. And this is the way that it's translated by Phillips. Indeed, we want to prove ourselves genuine ministers of God. Whatever we have to go through, patient endurance of troubles or even disasters or floggings or imprisonments and being mobbed, and we have to work like slaves in hot weather, painting that old fence up there. But uh, <clears throat> being flogged or imprisoned, being mobbed, having to work like slaves, having to go without food or sleep, all this we want to meet with sincerity, with insight and patience by sheer kindness and the Holy Spirit, with genuine love, speaking the plain truth and living by the power of God. Our sole defense, our only weapon is a life of integrity, whether we meet honor or dishonor, Praise or blame, call impostors, call nobodies, never far from death, here we are alive, always going through it, but never going under. Isn't that nice? Previously he said we often get knocked down, but we don't get knocked out. Now, if, if this, this fight, we're, we're in a fight. Timothy, you're in a fight. I want to tell you something. It's a fight to the death. It's a fight till the end of the line. Here I am. I'm an old veteran. Here I am. I'm worn out. My body's limp, as you say. I, I, and I feasted and I fasted. I don't always understand him. He said, I know how to be abased and how to abound. I can't, I can't find where he, where he abounded. He seems to have been abased. He's in trouble, he's in prison, he's in adversity. And yet he says, they're all grist to my mill. They all do something for me. This is a very simple, and I, I, maybe it's not quite the right illustration to give here, I'm not sure, but, but um, <clears throat> I was talking with a, what we call a health nut not long ago. And uh, we were talking about eggs. I said, well, I, I, I don't take them. I understand they're pretty bad for cholesterol. He said, no, they're not. They're good for you. There's no cholesterol in eggs. Well, everybody says there is. Well, he said, not in the real egg. <laughs> well, I don't eat ostrich eggs. What kind of eggs do you mean? Uh, he said, well, those eggs that you buy in the shop, those white ones, they're always all white. They come from battery heads. Oh, they'll give you cholesterol like mad. But if you get hen eggs where the old hen scratches and takes the mineral out of the ground, you'll have no trouble with cholesterol. You see, you're getting the right stuff, you're getting the right mixture. A lot of us want heroism, but we want it kind of serving on a plate. We want maturity, but, but not with hardship, not with affliction. I want to be clothed, but don't strip me. Look, we're up against a relentless foe. God not only imputes righteousness to us, he imparts righteousness because he says he that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. And I'm a righteous man, you're a righteous woman and we live in an unrighteous world. We're truthful people in an untruthful world. We're pure people in an, unpure, in an impure world. Now when the enemy is coming like a flood, and if he hasn't come in now, well when in God's name is he coming? Just because we're not in concentration camps. America has never been more broken than it is this morning.
we more broken homes, we more kids broken with venereal disease under 16 years of age, we more girls broken with, with babies uh, under 16 years of age, we, we've, uh, we've more homes broken, we more people broken with alcohol, we're a broken nation, except we've no broken hearts over the broken nation. When the enemy has come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard. <coughs> the standard bearer goes forth saying, listen, we're declaring war. <coughs> As Jeffrey Bull says, we're not going to change this materialistic age. We're not going to change the world. As, uh, be, by the time we go to bed tonight, communism will have gained more ground than the Christian church. We're not going to upset it with clever dialogue. I'm quite sure in my own mind, this detente, detente with the, that America has right now with Russia is, is just a slowdown before the showdown. They're just deciding what temperature to cook us at. Side two. Plus Russia has got some ter terrible machines now that have at least 16 warheads in them and they can hit, what, a hundred nations, uh, a family, a hundred cities in America at once and according to statistics, liquidate 124 million of the population, which is half the population of the United States in less than five minutes. Oh, we're going to have a salt agreement because we've agreed to let them have 16 warheads in the, in the uh, rocket that they fire our 16 warheads and we've agreed we'll only have 18 hours. We give away everything conceivable to that wicked nation that has no change of heart and never will have unless there's revival. And then people say, if you could see the devastation. Well, I happen to live through two world wars. I happen to live through the second world war and... It's not funny to go out of the door in the morning and see that uh, almost every house in the district has gone except your own. To look and see a woman's body up in a tree and a baby's body in the gutter there and, uh, and member parts of people's bodies and blood running down the street. You see, one, one thing that doesn't grip the heart of Americans is this, that, 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 that none of us have been to war unless you went to another country. America has never fought a war on its own ground. It's fought them all in other countries. It won't fight the next one in another country. And when you see the devastation of war, you say, I used to go around the museum, it has a, a million or ten million dollars worth of art treasures, it has a Rembrandt, it has a Van Gogh, it has this, it has some... China from the Ming Dynasty, it has this, that, the other, and you see it all, and when you go, it's, it's vaporized. Well, that's part of it. But don't you think that because that man saw the beauty and glory of Jesus on the Damascus Road, and then he was lifted into heavenly places, and he lived there, though he lived on earth, and he saw what God designed, like the brother taught this morning about hurting God, before we go to bed tonight, God will have been wounded a million times. Not out of Russia, out of America. Out of England. Maybe I told you I was praying, I was in a house in the Bahamas a few years ago, and I looked out from the window there, the sky was gorgeous, there wasn't a cloud. And then suddenly there was a great big mushroom of filthy smoke. Somebody was burning old tires, and there the, the, the um, <coughs> filth was going up in the sky. I thought, boy, I'm glad I'm not over there, that would smell terrible. It looked horrible. I turned this way and somebody was burning maybe palm leaves and they don't give any black smoke, they give pure white smoke. And here's this vast column of black smoke going up and over here there's a little thin whisper of white smoke going up. And that was it, I forgot all about it. And I was praying at home by the couch one day and the Lord said, you see the picture? You see the sin of the nation? Do you remember that column of smoke you saw rising up? Black, filthy smoke? Mm -hmm. And you remember a little wisp of, wisp of white smoke going up? Mm -hmm. Well, that black column of, of, of impure, rotten smoke is typical of all the cursing and profanity and pornography and dirty jokes and lying and the taking of the name of the Son of God in vain that rises every day out of America. And that little thin white wisp of smoke is the praise I get from my people. Let me finish here, supposing instead of seeing when a bomb has fallen, you see the great abyss, the torn, the heart of the, the ground up, it's pulled down buildings, it's shattered communities. Supposing God could give us, but I'm sure he can't, a vision as he sees the world. I remember praying with a school teacher in Canada some years ago. I knew a father, he's the Minister of Health for the western part of the Canada, he lived in our home, we took him in when he was thrown out of a church and for a, 
a year or more, he had no home, he had no money, and we fed him and clothed him, and we got riches out of him out of his spiritual life. I knelt with that young lady. She's a brilliant scholar. She has a number of degrees. She speaks a number of languages. And she knelt there, and when she prayed, she'd had a profession of religion, but she got saved that day. And when she finished, she paused, and I waited, and she said this, Oh, God, will you please let me see the world as you see it? And I called her by her name and I said, look, my dear, supposing I had an apple here and I could cut it into, outside it's red, the skin is beautiful, I cut it too and it's full of corruption and worms and filth. If God were to slice the world in two and let you see it as he sees it in all its degradation, in all its rebellion, in all its wickedness, you'd die of shock. If this moment somehow God magically could let me see every girl that's in a back alley in New York or Louis, uh, St. Louis or somewhere else, she sold her body last night. She suspects she's full of venereal disease. She, she's going to expect a baby. She doesn't want the folk to know. The boys down in the gutter we used to see in New York. And they didn't all come out of ghettos. Some came out of university. And you see the shattered home. Why, even the radio, the TV has been saying this week, the greatest scourge in the country, the second greatest scourge right now is, is what? Suicide. Talking with David Wilkinson the other day, he said, I'm getting tremendous response. I don't ask people, uh, I, I, I do ask people rather, he said, how many of you under 16 have tried to commit suicide? You'll be amazed how many hands have gone up. How many of you older people? It's amazing. There's a, there's a frustration. There's a sense of lostness. Right now the world just generation doesn't know where it's going. Somebody, I forget his name, said this, right now we live in this world, with all its advanced technology, we live in a theater of the absurd. You know, it seems to me that the Christian life, or the life of most people, professing Christians, could be explained in three words. This is where we were when he found us. Degradation, and then salvation, and then stagnation. We've been lifted out of the pit, praise the Lord. Isn't it nice? I'm so glad. You know. Paul is saying to this young man, listen, you're a soldier of Jesus Christ. I want to tell you something, you've got a fall, he'll try every trick. Against you is the world, the flesh and the devil. In, in you, he will have saved you this way. He'll have saved your mind. Therefore, put on the, as, as Paul said in Ephesians, put on the helmet of salvation. What does the helmet do? It guards the mind. Keep your mind stayed on him. If your mind is stayed on him, the enemy can't get in the same. I've used the illustration of putting a phonograph disc on and <clears throat> if I don't press the button and it goes round, well, what happens? Well, I can take some sugar or sand and pour it on. But supposing I do that and then I, I take the uh, disc off, the platter off and I, I throw off the sand and I clean it and I put it on. Again, I press the button and the thing goes round. Pour sand on now and see what happens. It'll fly in a thousand directions. If my mind is stayed on him, I can't have a vacuum of the mind. My mind must be stayed on him on his exceeding great and precious promises. After all, the goal that God has for us is not just to be saved. The goal is the kingdom of God. He wants his kingdom setting up in the hearts of men and women, not just to rescue them from hell, but to establish the principles of righteousness and holiness in their lives. That's the goal of God. We're in a warfare. The equipment is this. You should receive power. The Holy Ghost is coming upon you. He's going to attack my mind. He's going to attack my spirit. He's going to attack my body. And yet I have covering for it through the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, it doesn't mean, after all, this is a fight to the end. It's a fight with no holds barred. Satan is no gentleman. He's not going to give up. If he can't attack you one way, he'll attack the other. If he can't come with subtlety, he'll come openly. If he can't come openly, he'll come through the last channel you thought of. You know what does the psalmist say it in Psalm 1 where he talks about Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. And then he goes on and so forth. Well, you know, I, I don't have much problem with, with the sinners. I can stand the contradiction of sinners, it's the criticism of saints that gets you down. It's those folk that you thought were just a little bit more spiritual, and then suddenly with subtlety something comes and, ooh, it hurts, doesn't it? Let's just say this, maybe I'm, 
Time's up, but let me say just one thing here. This doesn't matter, it goes on film or not. <clears throat> I said I think the greatest honor that men can receive is that given to the Apostle Paul. When demons said, Jesus we know and Paul we know. When God can look down and say, in that, that girl in Agape, that boy, that fellow in Agape, a few years ago, he was the most twisted, corrupt, divorced, lying, deceitful, cheating character, and I just can't get a finger hold on him now. He, he's, he's walking in God, he's walking in grace, he's obedient to the heavenly vision, and he's pressing on to a certain goal. For after all, there has to be a goal for all of us. That's great. That's wonderful. When Satan has to pay respect and say, Jesus I know, and John I know, and Jack I know, and Mary I know, and Kathleen I know. The other thing is when God can put me on exhibition and say to the devil, Hey, come here a minute. I want to show you something. After all, that's what he did, didn't he, with Job? It, it, it isn't the challenge of, of, of Satan to God, it's the challenge of God to Satan. Hast thou considered my servant Job? There's nobody like him in the earth. And in what Satan did, he told the truth for once. He didn't laugh, but he told the truth. What did he do? Well, he said, uh, I want to remind you of something, God. Do you know the reason why that man is such a good man? He said because his, his piety is tied up with his prosperity. Now listen to what Satan said. You, God, you put a hedge about him. Isn't that an admission? You don't think so? Well, cheer up, it is. I believe with Hudson Taylor that by the time a thing gets to you, however devilish it looks, and the pastor doesn't have an answer, and nobody on the staff here has an answer, that by the time that thing gets to you, it's God's will for you. Are you suggesting that a part of me, I'm more precious than the crown jewels, so are you. Are you suggesting Satan can come and kick me that way if he wants, or push me that way if he wants? Am I a dead leaf that's blown in the wind? Satan says, God, you put a hedge round about your child. Isn't that great? I've got a hedge round me. I've got the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ around me. I've got the promises of God. I'm well insulated. I'm not impervious to the world, but I'm not kicked around by the devil. He says, you've got a, a, a hedge round about it. You take the hedge away and let me get at him. And you know what? And I'm so glad of this. God never takes advice, not even from the devil. He doesn't take it from me. I've tried it often, but he doesn't take it. But uh, <clears throat> he doesn't even take it from Satan. You put a hedge. All right, this, this represents Job. Here's the hedge. Take, the, take it away and let me get it. And God says, I won't do that. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll pull it in a bit nearer. And go on, do your worst. And he goes, and what does he do? Job goes to bed at multi-millionaire, he gets up in the morning broke. Everything's destroyed. Satan goes to report to God. I guess he does this every day, but anyhow he goes to God. And God says, how do you get on with Job? Don't know where with him. You take that hedge away. God says, I won't do that, I'll pull it in a bit nearer. Now the first stroke, he took all his properties. Multi-million dollars went down the drain, so he took what? His first stroke was bankruptcy. He comes again, the hedge has been pulled in, and he goes and destroys all the children. He destroys everything in the way of the family, and he goes back to God. And God says, how did you get on? He says, well, I, I made him bankrupt yesterday, and he didn't scream, and today I killed all his children. Fancy seven in a row. I know sometimes you said, I wish all you rats would get out of the way. But if they all died, you'd be pretty sorry, wouldn't you? You'd say, <coughs> no, I wish they were back again. But anyhow... He lost them all. All died. Well, now what do you say to this loving God of yours? Job says, well, I'll tell you, the Lord gave, and the devil took it all away. Did he say that? What did he say? Oh. Oh, I see. So when anything good comes in your life, you say, the Lord's been so good to me today my birthday and I got a new watch or my dad wrote and sent me five dollars my dad uh, called me this week and he said listen can't you send ten dollars home <clears throat> I 
Oh, the Lord only gives good things, eh? We blame the devil. Job didn't do that. He's like Paul. Paul never said, uh, do pray for me, I'm the prisoner of Nero. He wouldn't even give the devil credit for Nero. He said, I'm the apostle Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ. Boy, it's nice when you can snub the devil like that, isn't it? He's bankrupt. He's bereaved. He says, I don't quite understand it. It's a mystery, but uh, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. And then we miss something in Bond there. Do you know what he says? He shaved his head of worship. Huh? He didn't cry and say, Lord, everybody's criticizing me and I'm very puzzled about it. I feel like giving up and going home. Oh, no. He said the first stroke was bankruptcy, the second stroke is bereavement. And uh, he says, you take that uh, hedge away and let me get out of it. And he says, all right, all right, there you are, take it away. Now, go on, get out of it, what are you going to do? And he's smoking with boils from the top of his head to his feet. He couldn't stand, he couldn't sit, he couldn't walk. He's as uncomfortable as ever he could be. And um, <clears throat> Satan says, um, I think I've managed it. Bankruptcy, bereavement, boils. Job's lost everything, he's sitting there on his ash heap and he's itching and so he scratches where he itches the most and in come his friends, very real friends too. <laughs> Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the shoe height, he's a little guy, only a shoe height. And uh, <clears throat> then there were a lot of others came in and they ridiculed and, and then his wife came storming in, oh, just like the devil, took everything he had and left him with a 